Ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we have to be very clear here. We know that education is a human rights imperative, and I would say human dignity imperative. And it is also a development imperative, and we have strongly to emphasize this. We need to rethink the fundamentals of education for new times, to strengthen its human rights aspect, to deepen respect and mutual understanding, and to respond to a world of change. Education policies is the ultimate long-term policies. We strongly believe in that. And we need to be visionary. Of course, we do not start from scratch. And I believe we can build on these two landmark UNESCO reports. The first, learning to be the so-called four report, was published in 1972 and introduced the ideas of lifelong education and of learning societies. It was the first time ever these concepts, these notions, were introduced in the educational debate. The second, the Delors Report, Learning the Treasures Within, which was published in 1996, proposed a holistic, integrated vision of education based on the four pillars, learning to be, learning to know, learning to do, and learning to live together. All of this remains valid. But ladies and gentlemen, the context has changed, I would say, dramatically. The world is changing, and education must change too. Since the year 2000, many countries have made strong progress in expanding opportunities for formal basic education. But we all know, and you know it quite well, being educators yourself, this is not enough today in the 21st century. We must examine the quality of education, its relevance and its equity. We must grasp its ability to unlock the innovation all societies need. This is why inclusive, holistic, and flexible education and lifelong learning is so important. Facing such a change, unpredictable, precarious change, we have to go back to the basics, that is learning. Therefore, the law report and fall report was so visionary at a time when people didn't what I mentioned, the changes happened only in the past 20, 15 years. Before that, it was not like that. And, but education is still there. So I think this is important. In my own system, we started our reform in 1999. And in the first three years, all the reports start with one sentence. Society has changed. Society has changed. And that is fundamental. Values, principles remain fundamental. Values of social justice, even within those four pillars, values of human rights, values of solidarity, so that even the four pillars themselves, you need to interpret them within values of non-sexism, where on an ongoing basis, we have to confront patriarchy, so that you don't, at the end of the day, keep on saying you have to protect the girl child. So even in your planning, in your visioning, you have to make sure that you embed these values and principles, even in the implementation of those uh, uh, four pillars, so they still remain relevant. They have to be interpreted with what the gaps are, what the challenges are on an ongoing basis. Mutual understanding, they're at the heart of what we do at the Institute and the Fulbright program globally, but that's the way you operationalize what Professor Moran was talking about two days ago. That's the way you teach people to learn to live together. Our problem is it's not yet an explicit part of education, yet it's the most important contribution education could make at every level because educated people plan and make war. Angie, I think you've probably got something very useful to contribute to this because obviously in the post-apartheid era, this is something that you've, you've really had to broach head on, this issue of living together. Well, what can you tell us about that? How are you dealing with that in the classroom? You can only educate the nation with the nation and therefore mobilizing the nation itself to this common vision of this world that you want to live in. So it's really mobilizing society broader than the school itself to ensure that you can bring up your kids as a nation
to what's this vision of the world that you all want to, you're aspiring for? Learning to apply the knowledge, learning to do has, has been really the, the basic uh, progress in education and the concern of education. In the last 20 years, I would say, uh, we, we feel that we have failed in many aspects and, and we're speaking of soft knowledge and we don't know really how to deal with them. We, we have not built a sufficient experience in order to implement our desire for people to, to be better and also to live together better, the other two uh, pillars. So I think we're a little bit walking with our eyes uh, shielded without seeing very well our path. And so I see a, a, an experimental endeavor in this area. And so to your question, how should we train teachers? I don't have a clear-cut answer. But I think we have to train teachers properly and we have to have concern for these other dimensions of, of teaching and learning, especially. Education is lifelong, and that lifelong means before schooling and after schooling. It's life-wide, which is beyond schools. And you think of uh, the, for, uh, our graduates, they don't only work as uh, economic means, not only as human resources. They have to have family, uh, life, they have to have political life, they have to have religious life, cultural life. But you think of the society now, social unrest is everywhere. War to potentials are mounting. If we only think that they will be in a stable, secure life in the next 30, 40 years, we are not preparing them, we are unfair to them. Therefore, living together, living, live together is not only an ideal, it's a very pragmatic need. Culture and science and technology have advanced so fast, and it's usually faster than biological evolution. We are wired to form groups that war between each other. And we need to admit this fact. This has served us very well in the past. As, 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 as early humans, it has served us a lot. It has served us well, it made us survive. But now, it's going to destroy us. We must admit admit this truth. We must know it and overcome it. Mobility and keeping the doors open uh, in every society is critical to learning to live together. From the discussion here, I come up with three dimensions which may be added on or included in the four pillars. One is uh, learning to serve. Learning to live together may not mean learning to serve. And serving, uh, service like learning is so widespread now. The second is from what uh, Francisco says, learning to live with nature, with the, na with the nature. And the third one perhaps is less touched upon and happens after the law report, is learning to create. That means to innovate, to think outside the box, to be critical, to be entrepreneurial. And that perhaps uh, has to be added into, uh, included into the pillars. Forgive me for being narrow in focus on the Millennium Goals because I am worried. I'm, I'm worried they succeeded too much because we're not prepared, certainly in tertiary education, to have 100 million more people enter universities. Maybe we can build the buildings. And maybe we can have online materials. But it takes 20 years to build a faculty member, sometimes longer, and we don't have enough faculty members for the demand that's going to be out there. So any new set of Millennium Development Goals really ought to address secondary education and also tertiary education, lest we have 100 million people that have no seats, no place to go, no further education to which they can aspire. I think that would be a terrible disappointment for the next generation. Teachers are very central. It means also as we push for those millennium development goals, we need to prepare for them. And I think the lessons also of developed countries will inform us so that as we push beyond the basic education, what it will take to maintain the quality that we all aspire for without compromising the quality when we move for full access. I think that equity requires that we open tertiary education, higher high education to people that have not had access for generations in their families and backgrounds. <clears throat> so if we are going to train them up to the level of secondary education, they ought to have access to tertiary education as well. 
But if we are going to set up a goal for a tertiary education being available for all, then I would insert the word quality. Quality tertiary education, and this is along the line that Alan was mentioning, it's irresponsible to open up the doors of a building and call it a university and give graduation, give prof professional degrees to people that will fail in life and will become very frustrated because they, the, the promise was not fulfilled on their case. What is the dream of uh, introducing and putting learning into the center stage of education is when our students are more autonomous, active learners. And that is the test of the real uh, learning society. I, I'm afraid in that aspect, the learning science, the research on learning, combining neuroscience, psychology, pedagogy, and so on and so forth, IT, is not so much known to the education, society, uh, education community, less known to the policy makers. And that has to, be, to, be, uh, to provide us the evidence for moving towards a real learning society. There are many, many success stories. Mm -hmm. Many, many systems are already moving forward. Many, many educators, policy makers have some bits and pieces, sometimes even larger than bits and pieces, which are moving forward. I think UNESCO and other organizations have the responsibility to collect this, to show people that there is a way forward. Today we see we are more focusing on learning. And the learning is a center of the education. But we still have to say education, because education is responsibility of the society, of the government, to provide to their citizens. But learning is the nature of education. UNESCO and the UNICEF, we joined to promote, we should say, provide equitable, quality education and a lifelong learning for all. So, for this, with the different countries, different conditions, we should have a minimum standard for everybody, but also based on different countries' conditions, they can have a different higher level standard. The last point I want to make, the debate on post-2015, this is only talking about the next 15 years. This is not enough. We have to contribute to the global debate on what exactly education for. So now we're talking about a new paradigm, a new thinking, new way of doing, and out of our own box. The debate today actually already start initiate this kind of a global debate. And UNESCO, with its mandate, is happy to be the platform in the years to come to provide everybody, policymakers, teachers, students, parents, and the societies to join this debate to think about education of today and tomorrow. Let's go for it. Thank you.